Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to use the microphone in case uh, there's, it ends up being some random noise. Uh, a couple of caveats about the WeWork space. Uh, we love it very much being here. That's not a caveat. The caveat is uh, there will be occasional uh, streaming going on over there. There's a ping pong room. Uh, and then there will occasionally be people who come up through this uh, stairwell and they have no idea what's going on in this room. So they're going to come in and they're going to stop and like wonder, did I interrupt something? Is that food for me? What's going on over here? So that's going to happen. Just, just know that's going to happen at some point. Uh, but please, uh, as we said earlier, help yourselves to food, drink, everything over here. Uh, beer, uh, beer taps uh, in the back over there. Uh, because uh, this is all for you. We really appreciate you being here. So uh, if you need the Wi-Fi, the network is we work guests and you don't need a password. Restrooms are down this hallway over here. So the second hallway behind this one, uh, back behind the kitchen over here is the, at the end of the hall is the restroom. So uh, they're easily accessible anytime. Uh, so welcome to our info night. Uh, we are designation. We are not design nation. It is okay if you thought that was how it was pronounced. We are not that clever. Um, also, uh, a special hello to our folks over here who are uh, watching this uh, virtually from wherever in the world. We're really happy you guys are here tonight. Uh, Courtney and Sarah over here kind of manning that uh, stream. And in, in case anybody comes up with a question, just do like a, we'll make sure that gets answered. Uh, similarly, if you, anybody has a question as we go through the information, please feel free to raise your hand, stop me. Uh, we'll, we'd love to talk about whatever's on your mind. Just make sure that uh, you have a chance to have your question answered, whatever that might be. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, I'm getting over, well, I'm just starting to have a cold, I guess. Hopefully I'm getting over it. Uh, so I'm a little low energy for the evening. Uh, we have a few people here today I just wanted to introduce again. Uh, that's Sarah and Courtney. Uh, Sarah's our head of marketing. Courtney is our admissions uh, uh, director. Uh, we have some designers currently going to the program over here. Uh, that's Andrew, Sarah, and uh, Tiffany. They are all UI designers. Uh, we have Dan Hopewell, who's one of our creative directors over here in the beard. Uh, Emily and Mary behind him are graduates of designation. Uh, Emily works at Walgreens down the street. Mary works at 8-Bit Studios. Uh, we've asked them to come to these info nights before so they can sort of talk about their experiences, uh, give you some other uh, perspectives that maybe are going to be useful for you uh, if you're thinking about going to the program. Uh, so uh, we will hear from everybody uh, eventually throughout the, uh, the evening. But uh, so thank you again for coming. Uh, this is a really important um, event for us because it gives all of you hopefully the first chance to learn about designation, uh, what it's like to attend here, what it's like to work with us in some capacity. Um, there are lots of ways to get involved in the program, not just go through it. So uh, whatever your reason may be for being here, we hope that uh, tonight's uh, slides and everything, all the other information here, uh, answers those questions, gives you what you're looking for, and you're able to take the next step with us if that's applying or submitting a request for a proposal to work with us or hiring a graduate or whatever that might be. Um, so I want to start by talking a little bit in broad terms about uh, what designation is and isn't, uh, because there are a lot of concerns that people have or a lot of frustrations that people have about programs like ours. Uh, you may have heard the term design bootcamp. Uh, that's a, a term that gets thrown around a lot in the industry today. And we uh, are no longer a design bootcamp. We are, we call ourselves an immersive uh, design program. That's because, uh, as we'll talk about throughout the evening, bootcamps offer a certain set of features that we no longer offer. Uh, so we are a unique program. Uh, if you have read any of our uh, alumni reviews of a program, any of our interviews, other news items, you know how different we are and unique we are from uh, design boot camps. One of the things that uh, boot camp will uh, tell you is that uh, you, you go through it to just get an entirely new career. And almost in the sense that whatever came before you, whatever came before that program doesn't really matter, it doesn't, doesn't really exist. Um, and one of the biggest things we found uh, from day one at designation is people who go to the program come with all kinds of backgrounds and experiences that um, that they bring with them. Uh, hey, uh, so if you could turn up the microphone just a little bit, awesome, thank you. Uh, and uh, you know, people who have been uh, bartenders and server staff, people who've been lawyers and chefs, people who've been teachers uh, in in whatever country uh, they taught in, uh, there's so much experience that is really really useful and relevant to designation to make you a better designer. You are always, when you go through the designation, you are a designer plus whatever it was you were before. Maybe that's just somebody who's 
really excited about whatever they're doing. Maybe it's somebody who collects records or is a great public speaker or rides a skateboard or you know has worked at Starbucks for 15 years or makes jewelry or whatever that is. Like all of that is very, very important. Um, and it's really about looking at ways to incorporate those past experiences uh, in new ways uh, and looking at opportunities to use them in really, really valuable ways to make sure that you are always more than just a designer, more than only a designer. Uh, another the thing about boot camps that you hear a lot is it, it, it really is about learning tools. A big part of boot camp curriculum uh, is about just learning specific design tools that are out there, specific programs like Sketch or uh, Adobe XD or Figma or Envision. Uh, there are lots of tools out there that do the job that are an important part of designing, but a program like ours cannot just be a place where you learn design tools. So that's a huge part of it, but it's really much more about how you, what you do with that information, what you do with that knowledge, and you apply it forward, in fact, through the rest of your career. So it really is about what we do here is teaching how to learn uh, and teaching how to continue learning continuing to be self-sufficient and continuing to be excited about the design industry long, long after you've come through desperation. There's also an ice machine. <laughs> um, we are definitely a design program. Uh, you will learn all about design in many, many forms here, but at the root of design is good communication. Uh, a piece that's designed cannot exist, cannot succeed cannot find users or become a really amazing product without communicating what it needs to do really effectively. And that's the secret behind being a designer is you have to be a good communicator, uh, not just a good designer in order to succeed in, in the world. So we really focus on communication and that's not just how to convey your ideas visually and through uh, process and research, but it's also communicating with your teammates, communicating with users, communicating with all the creative directors and staff that you encounter designation and other people around you. Um, communication is so much a big part of design that that's really what we do here. And the more you go through, the longer you go through designation, the more you see it more obviously focused on communication and less on those sort of hard skills of design. Um, finally, one thing about boot camps that you hear a lot if you read reviews or you're aware of, of some of these programs is a lot of people say it's really, really hard. And it's true. Boot camps and programs like ours have to be difficult, have to be challenging because you're uh, combining about a year or two years of activity and knowledge into three months or six months in the case of designation. Um, so it is difficult, but we believe that that difficulty, that challenge, actually produces a reward. And that reward is something that's earned. It's never given. So it's something that feels more meaningful to you and to everybody who comes to the program. Because when you survive a program like designation, you come out of it knowing all kinds of things. You come out of it with so many new skills. And hopefully you come out of it with a, a new career that's going to be vastly more rewarding and engaging for you than the one you had previously. So a few other things that we are want to talk about. Uh, our home is right over there. If you sort of follow the trail of uh, post-it notes, uh, we're back in the back there. Um, and this is our home base for uh, all of our designers and cohorts. So people don't live here because you can't live here. But uh, you work here uh, you know, more than regular hours, more than working hours. Uh, so from 10 a.m., 9 a.m., so somewhere like that, to 7, 8, 9 p.m., uh, people are working right here. Something you can see that we're really happy about is all that natural light in the back. Um, it, it's kind of really difficult to get away from sunlight these days, uh, designation. That's something we're very, very happy about. Uh, we are definitely team-centered. Um, in fact, I often say that we are team-centered, not user-centered. Um, every design everywhere is user-centered. Every That's like saying chairs are ergonomic. Uh, that just means they're designed for people to sit in them. So of course they are, of course they should be. Um, so the user is always a part of the team. There's the design team, there's the team of designers plus the creative director and staff members. There's the, the user that's in there, there's the client, there's all the other people who are involved in that, in that uh, building of that product in some capacity, always part of the team. So everything that you learn at designation is about being part of the team, a successful, engaged um, part of that team. Uh, we're, and a part of team, uh, being team minded is being collaboration minded. You're always working with somebody. You're always working for somebody. Um, and that collaboration is really, really important. Also plants are really important because they help make people feel better. 
Uh, we are also, as you, you saw with all those post-its uh, throughout here, um, we collect data in all kinds of forms. And that's not necessarily numbers or statistics, it's qualitative data. The findings, the insights, the challenges, the highs and lows that people have, the curse words and the joys, all the things that they want to talk about using this product or ways that they engage with the world through technology, we record all of that data and we have to sift through it. And so a big part of the designation experience is collecting all this data and finding ways to make sense of it. And that may be something that is very defined. It's a screen, it's an app, it's a logo, it's a whatever, or it may be something that is uh, far less tangible. It's a process, it's an idea. It's a way of you approaching this design problem. So there's a lot of really cool things that come out of learning how to work with data. Um, and that's a big, big part of this experience too. We are absolutely feedback centered. Feedback and critique, critique is so much of an important part of being a professional designer in almost any design process, uh, in any design uh, profession. Uh, it's really about making sure that you put yourself out there, you put the work out there for other people. And some of those people are going to be vastly more qualified than you are. Uh, to understand design, to understand how something should be done. And they're gonna provide feedback and that feedback will always be actionable. It will always be specific and it will always be kind. So it's not necessarily going to be uh, something that just says, somebody says, oh, this thing sucks and you gotta redo it. It's let's talk about how it can be stronger. Let's get you to a point where you feel really good about going back and making changes and understanding that that's really, really important. So the feedback comes at you on a daily, hourly, minute by minute basis throughout designation. And it's really, really valuable to everybody's growth because as you're part of a team, as you're collaborating together, you have to get feedback from those other people who are around you. We are definitely uh, reflection centered. We ask people to journal every night, for example. And journaling is not, uh, hey journal, I ate um, you know, happy meal today. It's, uh, I, here's something I learned about myself. I learned that I don't take criticism very well and I need to work on that. Here are some ways I wanna work on that. Or it's, hey, you know, today I learned how to create wireframes. And it's really valuable to me because I knew the step before designing the wireframe and how to really take advantage of that. So it's looking at, uh, reflecting on the day, reflecting on the week, the phase, the, the entire process and understanding where your day fits into that larger process, where your various insights and thoughts fit into that larger process. Uh, we are definitely celebration centered. Um, we are more so now that we're in WeWork and we have access to these beer taps, um, but it's we definitely want people to feel proud and happy of the work they accomplish. When you're in a boot, a boot camp or a program like ours, it can be very, very difficult to get your head out of the sand. You're just, you're working every day, we, we always think it's important to stop and understand what you've gained over the course of that day, over the course of that week, because over a day, or over a week, you actually learn a hell of a lot. It's amazing how fast you grow. And we want people to celebrate that and, and be able to understand how great that is, because that's something that can last a lifetime, can last long beyond you know, when you're at designation. Finally, we are also dog friendly, um, which is a big change for designation. It's happened since we moved here to, to WeWork. Uh, we have three and a half dogs that roam around uh, designation uh, with some frequency. There are many other dogs who are around the building. Um, and even though we occasionally have a designer who is allergic to dogs, uh, they suck it up and uh, we're able to have, yeah, it's um, We're able to have dogs in the space and how can you not love a dog wandering into you? with its puppy dog eyes, and you just want to decide for it. So uh, we're really happy to, to have dogs as part of the culture of designation. Uh, they are a designer's best friend indeed. Um, finally, I just want to end this section by uh, introducing the rest of our staff. Uh, we also have Doug Vance, who is over here on the water tank, uh, who is one of our creative directors for the immersion phase. Um, we have James, who's on vacation this week, Jancy, Adam, Joshua. They're part of our virtual phase creative director team. Uh, we have Megan, uh, another client phase director who's around the building somewhere. Uh, and we have Aaron, our CEO, who's also out of town today. Any questions so far that anybody's curious about? Also, do we have any from the remote folks? Okay. All right, we will just power ahead here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we hold dear as values at designation because this is something that is pretty hard to, um, to find from a lot of programs like ours is what they believe in and what they practice. 
Um, we all on staff believe that the companies we've worked at in the past who published their values, who made their values known, were companies that were more valuable to work for. They were more rewarding to work for. So this is something that we talk about in every Infra Night. We're going to have it on our website this year. Uh, we talk about it in every environment we can because it's really important for people to know what we stand for. And some of these things we build a lot of our curriculum around. So empathy and service. Empathy is really about understanding everybody else around you in so many different ways. It's not just you know, that somebody's wearing a particular set of shoes, it's why. And what does those shoes say about them and where do those shoes come from and all the other facts about them and all the other insights they can gain that are happy or sad or interesting or minute. Um, all that information is really important because we're designing, always designing for other people, always working for other people. So we have to understand them as much as we can. Um, discovery is a hugely vital part of the designation experience and the design process in general. We have to be able to discover insights about ourselves, about the people around us, the users that we're designing for, but also just finding inspiration and exploring the world. The, this thing called the internet is amazing, and there are so many resources there, there's so many stories, there are so many successes and case studies and triumphs and really awesome memes and videos and everything else that can just enrich your life either professionally or personally. And we want people to explore those, we want people to discover those and share them among our community. And that's really, really valuable when people do that. Um, failure is a big part of the design experience. You, everybody fails in some capacity, and that may be on a tiny scale, or that may be something that is massive and gigantic. But the point of failure is not to fail. The point of failure is always to learn from that mistake and say, I have figured out why I'm never gonna make that mistake again, why I'm going to correct my process or make myself better or stronger in some way to make sure I don't do that. And that's resiliency, when you pick yourself up after failing and saying, here's how I know I can be better, I can be stronger. And that's such a big part of, the, of this experience, because again, everybody will fail in some part at designation. So you have to be able to deal with that, be able to get past it, and be able to learn something from that to be able to keep going. Um, iterative learning, uh, we are definitely uh, an iterative experience here, and that means that nothing is actually finished. It's always good enough, or it's getting better little by little. Uh, if you think about uh, how many people here have uh, iPhones, think about how often Facebook publishes an update uh, as an app on your iPhone. It's every two weeks because they're constantly updating their app in some tiny way, but they're always doing that. And they, they give a little disclaimer that says we're, we always update every two weeks because we're always making improvements. So Facebook has put out, you know, 2,000 updates to, to their app at this point or more probably. Um, but they're really building that product and saying, this is what we want to put out in the world. We're going to test it. We're going to get feedback and come back. So designers at designation absolutely do the same thing. You're really building a product uh, as the product that needs to exist, not the product that you want to build, the product that's perfect. And that requires craft, is, requires uh, you getting to that point where you keep refining it and making it better and better. Um, there, there are some videos that went around recently about the kids in Japan who take a ball of... Uh, aluminum foil and they form it into, a, into like a solid metal ball. Have you guys seen those videos? They're unbelievable. That's craft in a nutshell, is being able to take something that's really raw and refining it over time. And that it may take weeks or months to be able to do that, but it's amazing where you come out of that process based on uh, looking at back at where you started that process. Um, flexibility is similar to resiliency. There's always pivots that are needed and those pivots may be internal. You decide you have to change your process or do something different for a client, or they may be external and you have to be able to deal with those at any given time, but they make a, a better result, a better outcome, a better product. And ambiguity is a really tough one for a lot of people. Uh, if you've only had experience in right and wrong, and yes or no answers, especially from high school and college, ambiguity is one of the hardest things to understand, to grasp, and to get really good at. It means there's no right answers. And if that question of, what well, is there a right answer to this problem, um, uh, and I say it depends, and that makes you crazy, then designation will be very challenging at the beginning. But over time, when you learn to understand ambiguity, you learn to understand your own decision-making process. You look at all the options that are in front of you, and you weigh them to say, which one's going to be the most advantageous, short-term, mid-term, long-term, tomorrow, you know, 10 years from now, whatever that's going to be. Uh, so it's really important to be able to understand that process and say, um, I don't need a, a yes or no answer. I'm going to be able to be comfortable with, you know, it depends, comfortable with the possible directions that are in front of me. A few things we practice, which you may see in various design uh, processes around the world, but I do, we do, you do is something that we hold very uh, close to us. 
It means that the creative director uh, does it first, teaches it first, and then goes through with the cohort together that we do, and then trusts the cohort to be able to do it themselves on their own immediately or longer term from there. Three than me, we also ask designers to reference a bunch of things before they come to us with a question, mainly because that answer to that question has probably already been given in some form. So maybe it's a deck that they were given in a workshop, maybe it's uh, past uh, designers or cohorts that have done that, the same task in the past, or maybe it's uh, a resource that's available online. So we want people to use the references and the resources that are in front of them to make themselves more self-sufficient. I mentioned um, uh, iterative learning, uh, that's developing minimum viable products. And those, again, are products that are not perfect, they're not ready to be considered done, but they're putting out there and you're getting feedback on that, you're testing on that, iterating on it, and releasing another version. And that's something that you do over and over again at designation. Um, I mentioned feedback is actual, specific, and kind. That doesn't mean that it's always positive um, uh, feedback for you, but it's always going to be helpful. We guarantee that it's going to be helpful for you. Also, we follow the Stanford D School model of practice. There are many frameworks for design out there, but this is the one we've chosen to work with. And loosely translated, that's empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And every process we do follows those same five steps. You always begin with understanding people, you define the problem, you create possible options to solve that problem, you come to that solution and you test it, and you go through that process of refining it over and over again. Also, I mentioned it depends. Uh, you just have to get used to hearing this because it comes all the time. Uh, a few of the tools we use, uh, none that are super uh, 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 surprising here probably. We use Slack all the time for person-to-person uh, -person communication, person-to-cohort uh, communication. We use Canvas a lot, it's a learning management system that's really important. Uh, Google Calendar, uh, and we use Apple products, Apple laptops are very important. Um, the various UX and UI programs we use, Illustrator, Photoshop, Sketch, Actual Proto I would envision your principal, which is a prototyping uh, software. And then lots and lots of pencils, paper, post its, lots of notebooks, lots of sketchbooks, uh, lots of whiteboards, uh, really being able to get ideas down very, very quickly. Any questions so far? Okay, any questions from virtual folks? Okay. So uh, I wanted to go through our, uh, our the designation process uh, phase by phase. Um, to be able to kind of explain that to you and you can see how it builds on uh, previous steps. The first 12 weeks of designation, our first two phases, really about learning the hard skills of design, the tools, and that's learning how to design. And then you, you have to be able to do that, you have to be able to learn the tools because the tools build into a process. You use tools in a particular order. And once you have a process, you know how to, uh, yeah, how to understand that, how to, how to deploy that process whenever needed, how to modify it. So you grow from learning how to design to learning how to be a designer. And that comes in the next two phases where you really start to do these things for other people. You, you deploy those tools on behalf of other people, on behalf of, of uh, clients. And the final three weeks of the program are really about telling the story of your growth as a designer. So you've gone from really picking up all the hard skills to picking up a lot of the soft skills. This is teamwork, this is resiliency, this is uh, you know, designing uh, uh, very flexibly, Flexibly, is that a word? Anyway, thank you. Um, uh, a lot of things that come with you know how to deploy those tools in really important ways. And then at the end of it, it's saying, okay, well, I've learned all these things over the past 21 weeks, and obviously things that came before uh, whatever work I did at designation. How can I tell that story? Uh, and so this is really fundamentally different. It's not about doing the work. It's about communicating uh, the value of your work, communicating your value as a designer to the people that need uh, to find it. So it's creating uh, and learning how to use those tools. It's creating for other people. And then it's being able to tell those other people how good you are, how ready you are to be a professional designer and how skilled you are. So the first uh, phase is that first six weeks that we call it design essentials. That's learning the basics of user experience design, uh, interaction design, uh, information architecture and user interface design. These are just some of the many things we cover in these first six weeks. Uh, this phase is part-time. It's about 10 to 15 hours per week, and people can do design essentials from anywhere in the world that they live. Uh, so we expect that people will balance this time spent in this phase with a full-time or a part-time job. Uh, they're able to, again, work anywhere um, and be able to check in with their teams and with the creative directors, uh, usually in the evenings or uh, whenever that's needed. 
Uh, so that's broken down into this. We cover everything uh, between UX and UI. So it's essentials in the first week, synthesizing research and ideation, uh, doing interaction design in week three, visual design, then UI design, then uh, it's user testing and iteration. So taking all the things you've created through UX and UI and be able to test it and improve it and be able to move on to the next phase. So people will create things like competitive analysis. And again, this is the data heavy section. I believe this is slide one of four. So there's so much data here that people have collected for all of these competitors over and over and over again. And they, they take that data and they create the, the strongest persona they can for who's going to use this product to be able to understand uh, information about them, their motivations, their goals and frustrations. All, all this information is going to be helpful for them to make design decisions later on. They're going to create an app map where they understand what their uh, tool needs to do and how much it needs to you know, do for various people. So they, they're able to organize this in ways that are going to be very clear and easy to understand. And they create wireframes from this. They'll take all the decisions they need to make uh, for these, uh, for the persona, for their users, and be able to actually create the foundations of a, uh, of, a of an app, of a tool, of a product. And you understand how somebody's going to move through this step by step, and where they need to click, and what happens. How human beings will actually use a tool like this. Uh, on the UI side, they'll create style tiles where they start to understand the visual uh, language of this product. They'll start to create logos, export typefaces and images and things like that. They'll create high fidelity screens where they'll go from the wireframe to add the branding elements into creating a whole big set of screens here. Um, and on, uh, they, there's lots and lots of other things they do in the design essential space, but that's just a uh, glimpse into some of the things they create. So uh, what is this phase like? There are a couple of really big picture challenges that we're not going to sugarcoat. There are really challenging things that happen in every phase that we want to tell you about because that's part of understanding what these phases are going to be like. So the challenges in Design Essentials, uh, as I mentioned, feedback is really hard. Feedback is often qualitative, and that means it's not, there's not a number grade attached to it or a letter grade. It's going to be very uh, detailed and very meaningful and very individual to you and the work you've done. So that means qualitative performance is way more important than quantitative performance, and that can be difficult for people to get used to. So you have to understand that is coming to be comfortable with it and then know that you're going to be experiencing that right away. Um, as, I, as I showed you on that initial slide, there's like, I don't know, 45 things that we teach in uh, Design Essentials. That is a potentially overwhelming amount of information, so you have to be comfortable getting all of that in those six weeks, again, in 10 to 15 hours per week. And then there are challenges that are involved with working remotely. So you have to use Slack to talk to people. You have to use Zoom to watch videos. You have to use Canvas, which is a, that learning management platform. You have to use email and Google calendars and Skype and all those other remote tools. You have to work with people who are maybe around the world. So getting to know them, getting to know those tools that are going to help you work better together, collaborate together, is really, really valuable. And there are some awesome things that are going to happen in Design Essentials that we hear from almost every single person who goes through this phase of the program. Getting that regular feedback on projects from people who've been there, who've done this many, many hundreds of times is awesome. It's super valuable. And that sets the stage for getting feedback and accepting feedback and also giving feedback later on for the rest of the program. And that's awesome to get right away. There are skills that you gain uh, inside that potentially overwhelming amount of information that you'll build on for the rest of your career. Not just learning the tools that may not be around someday, but learning how to learn a tool, learning how to go through that, to go through the various tutorials or ask for help or find resources that, that do that. And then there's really, at the end of that, you know, week six in the user testing and iteration section, those are opportunities to not just practice the skills you've learned, but improve your projects and be able to go back and revise them. And that's super valuable to not just say, I'm done, but I can make this better. I know I can. I can take all that feedback and make it better. So we believe that at the end of Design Essentials, you will feel curious and excited to learn more because it's a part-time thing. Uh, when you uh, enter Design Essentials, you do so with the knowledge that you're probably going to continue on to the rest of the program. So hopefully it's a teaser. It's a, it's a taster. So you get those 10 to 15 hours a week uh, for those six weeks, and it makes you hopefully excited to learn more, to go deeper. So hopefully this is the, the feeling that we leave everybody with at the end of this phase. Any questions about Design Essentials? Any questions for virtual? Okay. 
All right, so the virtual phase is the next six weeks of the program, week seven through 12. And that's really about becoming proficient with the software and best practices that um, every designer or many, many designers out there use. So finding the, the sort of baseline understanding of what it takes to practice as a designer and building off of that very quickly. So there's even more that we cover in this phase because we're building on top of and surrounding all the tools and skills you learn in design essentials. And this is really where as they say, the rubber hits the road. Like you have to kind of go all in at this point. So this is the full-time phase. This is about 40 hours a week. Um, we still have check-ins and uh, meetings with your career director, with teams, about late afternoon. So the majority of people out there can work around this. Um, we do occasionally have people who keep up their part-time or full-time jobs as they're going through this phase. Uh, and it can be increasingly difficult to manage both of those things. So a lot of these tools, a lot of uh, skills, a lot of other uh, features and process uh, 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 topics that we cover in this phase, lots and lots about it. Uh, so as you, uh, in this phase, we actually split people up between UX and UI. So at the end of Design Essentials, you pick your track. You can either go to UX or go to UI. And the UX track focuses on these areas where a lot of these are fairly similar to what you learned in Design Essentials. You just go deeper. You go way, way deeper on these. So you cover user research, and synthesizing all of the design and strategizing about it, creating information architecture and understanding the interactions that humans will have with this product. You create wireframes and prototypes which will be better. They will be stronger and more in-depth than what you did in Design Essentials. You evaluate your work and then you iterate and refine it. And people in the uh, virtual UX phase, they do things like collect all this data about user interviews and put it all together digitally. They go through and create a task flow where they really understand uh, how somebody's going to move through this uh, this product, and what happens step by step, and they create journey maps. And these are the same, very similar things to what they do in Design Essentials. They're just going deeper. A journey map helps somebody understand what the ideal user, maybe the user persona, can actually go, how they go through step by step of this entire uh, product. And it's really great to see it step by step, the highs and lows the places where they interact with this product and places where they, they, they see frustrations. Uh, another example of a user flow uh, to be able to just understand everything uh, throughout this product. Creating a paper prototype, these are really cool. These are sketches that are done on uh, note paper, they're scanned in, and then these blue buttons are actually places where you tap. So you load in these pencil sketches into your phone, and you can actually tap on them and be able to move through screen by screen. Uh, I am old. Uh, I turned 38 last week, and I think this is magic. Every time I see somebody do this, uh, there's an app that allows you to do this uh, really, really easily. So it's really great to be able to see your work and start to have see how human beings go through it and use it. And it really is enlightening to you. Then they create low fidelity wireframes where they're just the very basic, and they're using you know the, the very sexy combination of Times New Roman and Arial uh, to be able to understand just in very basic terms how is somebody possibly going to use this product and how are they going to interact with this information. So very, very, very basic, just the basics of that, those icons and typography at that point. They'll uh, evaluate their uh, product or their site on a bunch of very important um, uh, metrics, like is it consistent? Is it, um, what's the aesthetic like? And they'll get really qualitative information um, at, from all these uh, th tests. And it's really valuable to collect this feedback and be able to improve your work. They'll also do usability testing where they go through with very specific tasks and find out how human, actual humans will use this in very specific ways. They'll update those low fidelity wireframes to be stronger and smarter and more detailed. And now you can see more of that layout really emerge. They're not looking at typography. They're not looking at the images or the colors. They're looking at how this should work, how this is supposed to work uh, for humans who are going to use it. And they'll go forward into high fidelity wireframes where it's all you know uh, black and white, but they're really looking at opportunities to use this information to make it as strong as possible. And they annotate it. So annotations are here to explain step by step what happens as somebody moves through this screen or moves through this app. And it can be incredibly valuable to understand that, and to explain that also uh, for anybody who's looking at this work. On the UI side, again, very similar things, but they're expanding, they're going deeper into visual design, into branding, into interaction design. That's the same in uh, UX week nine, by the way. Uh, mobile design, web design, design communication. So how can you really continue to build on all the process steps you learned in Design Essentials? 
So there's a ton of sketching. We love sketching. It's a very important part of getting a lot of ideas out of your head and onto paper. Uh, they'll do visual competitive analysis where they'll look at competitors and look at what's, what's going well for them, what's going poorly for them, uh, and where there's opportunity for their product to improve on that. They'll look at some logo options with color, with typography, with understanding why that logo must be the way it looks. They'll create style tiles, where style tiles are really looking at the overall style of that app, of that tool, and saying, generally speaking, what's the color style? What's the visual style? What's the typography going to look? How do I want to treat some of these elements, and how do I want them to work together? And that's very valuable for working out big picture uh, visual design uh, uh, challenges and questions in a really quick way before getting too deep into the details. Uh, they'll create user flow where they understand, especially on this mobile uh, screens here, how to go through a, uh, a product. And that's not too far away from the user flow that we talk about on the UX side. They'll look at micro interactions. Again, these are paper prototypes where you understand what happens in a various uh, pieces of, or parts of uh, this product to understand where somebody's going to move through it and find something that they're going to be really interested in. Find something that's going to make their experience in going through it much more engaging or pleasant. Even if that's just a little, you know, burst of confetti or a little, you know, an arrow that kind of points the way forward. Those micro interactions can be very valuable to help somebody work their way through your product. Again, user flow, but now it's visual, so you really understand step by step what happens when somebody clicks on the various buttons and how the information changes screen by screen. And they'll create a marketing site, so they'll design in mobile, but they'll also design a desktop version, understand how they need to work together, how they must be in synergy so that anybody who visits the marketing site or visits the, the, uh, the mobile site sees the same experience and gets a very similar experience between the two. And they'll create some key screens also. And they'll create style guides. And style guides really take all the, you know, you've just spent weeks putting together all the design elements of this tool, and then you break them apart. You understand how can I standardize these? A style guide is basically something you hand off to the next person who's going to work on your thing, the developer or another designer or somebody else like that. And you say, here is all the information, the raw data that you need to be able to build this yourself. And that's making them self-sufficient with the work that you're able to give them. That's really cool when you can do that. Some challenges in the virtual phase that we cannot, you know, we cannot sugarcoat. Designation becomes a full-time job. And we've heard from a lot of people, well, I tried to have a full-time job and do the virtual phase at the same time, and I shouldn't have done both. I should have stopped work or cut back on it significantly because it does become a 40-hour week job and sometimes more if design is something that's really tricky or challenging for you. Accountability in this phase goes up tremendously. So that's not just individual accountability of what you do and, and know for yourself, but it's about your accountability to your team. At this point, the team, teamwork and team collaboration is super valuable. It's really, really heavy in this phase and it just gets heavier uh, in later phases. Uh, there are still the challenges of virtual teamwork and it's, it's even harder when you have to collaborate on a minute by minute basis with your teammates. Uh, the pluses, the great things about the virtual phase, it's really immersive into team-based design. And we're really happy that we can provide that at this step in the process. Uh, you have scheduled check-ins every week with instructors and TAs. So you're getting that feedback, whether you want it or not, it's coming your way. And it's gonna be really, really valuable for you. And then at the end of the phase, there's a presentation of your final work to a panel of professionals. So those are people who are gonna critique your work, give you that ASK uh, feedback and make sure it's really valuable. And it gives you an opportunity to uh, reflect on your work, be able to explain it to somebody else, and make sure it's easily understood, and be able to improve it based on the feedback they give you. So that's really cool. We believe that at the end of the virtual phase, you have now come to this point where you're working on this much more heavily uh, as a 40 hour week or more uh, job, and you're ready for that impactful experience, the really impactful experience of coming to designation, coming to in-person, the in-person phases, and working with your team, with your cohort, together in person. Any questions about the virtual phase? Anyone so from? Can you use the virtual and all that section of the UX side yes. also done virtually? Yes. If not done on site? Correct. Uh, unless you and your team uh, are in the same city, which sometimes happens, uh, you pretty much, you know, one person has to be assigned to go conduct the interview. Then maybe another person will take the results of that interview and they'll transcribe it, they'll come out with data afterward, or they'll figure some way to do that collaboratively, but remotely. So there's a lot of using Skype and Google Hangouts too. 
Any other questions? Okay. The immersion phase. Uh, this is the point where people come into to our space here at WeWork. Um, and uh, it's really about developing expertise through really refining those hard skills, making sure that you really have understood all those hard skills you've collected in DE and virtual, and really also focusing on soft skills. So there are a lot of workshops and activities that happen throughout this phase that build uh, in an even greater way on what happened in the previous two phases. So lots of, of, uh, of, of uh, soft skill things here, learning how to give facilitated and personal feedback, um, lots of creative thinking. Uh, we have a workshop called The Sculpt, which we like to keep a surprise because it's really uh, engaging for people. Um, and lots and lots of things that happen in this phase. This phase is five weeks. Um, and we start with a competitive synthesis uh, where people really understand competitors. Everybody in the, in the program, both UX and UI, are, are working on projects, working on props, and they start with this point where they understand what's happening uh, among the competition in the uh, industry. They'll do a lot of whiteboarding sketches. We have a bunch of whiteboards in our room back there, uh, and we love it when people get really messy with uh, whiteboards to be able to explain a bunch of ideas very quickly and zero in on one that's gonna work really well for them. They create more journey maps, and maybe these are more detailed where they understand the highs and lows of that user and things that they need to keep in mind as they're trying to use this product. They create paper prototypes where they're able to take all that stuff uh, that they've designed and be able to actually print it out and treat it like it's an app, treat it like it's a screen that's in front of you before they go into that, you know, designing the more higher fidelity designing of it. Uh, and they can work out a lot of really quick decisions this way in really great ways. They'll do usability testing where they test people on very specific tasks and test the success of that. So something that doesn't task very that doesn't test very well may not make it to the next stage. It may have to be refined because the other one did better than that one. Uh, they'll create wireframes, especially the UX folks. We'll create wireframes. Again, these are more of the lower fidelity uh, wireframes where they're just figuring out the basics of the layout here to be able to understand uh, a lot of these design decisions that they want to make. They'll create responsive wireframes, so they'll look at the not just the mobile version, but the desktop version, and how they intersect, how they uh, change from one to the other, and how they really are going to be alike. Uh, the UI folks are going to create mood boards where they just find that mood, that, that sort of theme of the visual elements they want to put into their work and try to identify what that might look like on a big picture. They'll zoom into various style tiles. We call these divergent because they cover a lot of different types of uh, visual design uh, styles all in one kind of go. And they'll be able to pick one and move forward with that into the higher fidelity screen. So they'll create a UI kit, which is looking at all these various design elements uh, and understanding how they're going to work together, how the colors work together, how the uh, buttons work together, all this information works together. They'll create an interactive prototype. Boop. Uh, and to be able to explain how this is going to work uh, to the untrained eye, to anybody, especially users, who, who will need to understand what's going to happen if I download this app, if I use this app, and how is it going to engage with me and help me understand it. They'll create a bunch of key screens, especially on the UI side. So many key screens uh, where they're looking at every possible uh, area of importance for that app and understanding how they're going to be similar and how they need to be, uh, need to be distinct from each other. A lot of really great things happen in the immersion phase and a lot of challenges that we need to prepare people for. Uh, if you're not from Chicago, and everybody in this room, I believe, is from Chicago, but if you're not from Chicago and you come to Chicago, especially anywhere from, oh, I don't know, November to April, it's really cold. And there are a lot of challenges you have to deal with if, let's say, you're coming from Miami or coming from somewhere else that doesn't really get the concept of snow or wind. Um, and if you are in Chicago, then you're coming from whatever neighborhood you live in up over here into this WeWork space. And it's the challenge of being in a different environment, a unique environment that people have to be aware of and have to prepare for. Um, team communication is of utmost importance. You are a member of your team. You are centered among your team and everybody in your team is working to make you look better and you're working to make them look better. Um, and you have to be able to communicate and work together because that's really how you find success. It's not necessarily the work that you present to the client. It's about how your team works together and communicates everything they need to communicate to that client. And this is a 70 plus hour week. You'll start at what, 8 a.m., 9 a.m. some days and you'll go until uh, 9 p.m. midnight. You'll work six days a week, maybe seven. 
uh, if you're having a really, really busy week and you have to acclimate to that because it involves a lot of self-care. It involves a lot of taking some of that sunlight and going outside and taking a walk around the block or make sure you eat healthy, things like that. But that's a part of this immersive experience is the hours. And that's something that people really have to prepare for when they get here. Uh, on the plus side, there are a lot of really great things about these phases, but one of them is you get significant experience in user testing and user interviews, and that's going to benefit you no matter what you do as a designer. There's always people and companies who will appreciate you knowing how to talk with people, how to get insights from them, and how to test with them and get their, take their feedback and implement it really well. That's just something that will be beneficial for everybody at designation. The product that, that you work on for those five weeks uh, during the immersion phase is for a nonprofit, a for good or a community organization. So we work for uh, AIG of Chicago. We work for the Chicago Public Library. What was the uh, uh, what was the dog uh, project adoptable? Yeah, that's that was the first time we were dog friendly as we, we uh, wanted to design for um, uh, a uh, like a humane society type organization that, that took in and tried to find foster homes for uh, really challenging dogs. So we love being able to work for um, organizations that are doing really good in the community. Um, we love, we think that gives people a higher purpose for their design work. That's something that's gonna be even more meaningful for them. And it's meaningful when they put in the hours to be able to do that. Um, also at the end of every week um, is something really great that Doug developed about a year ago, which is weekly sprint reviews. And that's a film uh, process where you present your work to him and to other people. Um, and you go through step by step, slide by slide, feature by feature, and you get highly specific drill down feedback on every single thing that you and your team designs. And those screen reviews last hours, and they take a lot <laughs> out of Doug. But they are so they're so great to be able to do that. You get everybody gets what three screen reviews, and then your final presentation. So you've presented your work four times by the end of it. And you're so comfortable being able to present your work and you're so ready to be able to get that feedback, you know what to do with it by the end of it, that it's really awesome to be able to have that experience over and over again. So by the end of the immersion phase, if you are not dead tired, um, then we believe that people at this point feel really strengthened by this. Again, the idea of the team-centered design, it's not just the team that's you and your designers around you, your UI designers or your UX designers, but it's all the teams you're a part of. It's you and the creative director, it's you and the designers and residents, you and the staff, you and the users that you've worked with, you and the clients, um, and all the people that you've encountered uh, that are on your team, you feel strengthened by them because you're designing for them and you're designing with them. And that is a very empowering thing to be able to feel. It's different from just getting the hang of the, of the knowledge of these tools. So that's really, really great in this phase. Any questions about the immersion phase? Doug, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, oh, it's about five reviews. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what we do. Um, about five reviews. So, yeah, you actually get through one, two, three, four. There's a, there's a practice, and then there's a final. Uh, there's a fact that this is going on. This is going on. Yeah. yeah. They can't see you, yeah, but they can hear you. Do you really want to walk in front of Yeah, you actually get five, um, five total reviews where. Um, you guys will go through sprint one, two, one, two, and three, and there's a practice present. Uh, there's, the fourth one is going to be a practice, uh, and then you're going to do a final presentation where I'm not judging you guys, but you'll be in front of a group of critics, uh, and those critics themselves are going to be uh, sourced from all the industry contacts that Mike has. Uh, you'll have a couple of people sometimes who are actually the clients uh, of the project you're working on, but it's going to be real great feedback that you guys can use to iterate again on your uh, uh, your annotated wireframes or your style tiles or whatever else. So. Uh, it's good stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, the UI team over here, do you guys have anything you want to add having gone through the immersion phase pretty recently? It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Doug is great. He gives great feedback. Doug is great. He gives great feedback. I am recount I'm not repeating you. I'm recounting for the people who are virtual to make sure they know how great Doug is. Also, I thought for a second you said dog is great. And also, dog is great. I won't specify. Dogs commence to designation. Any questions anybody has about the immersion phase? Okay. The uh, fourth of five phases that we have is a four week phase called the client phase. And the client phase is really uh, a, a, one of the most unique features of designation. It's where you solve real problems for real businesses, real companies. 
And that means there are not that many new things that we talk about in this phase. Many things that you learn, there are things that you refine, things you get much better at because you're doing them for a, an, an external client. And you're doing things that are really important because these clients come to designation, they have money that they are investing in this design work. They have people and teams and hiring needs. They maybe are going in for funding or they're trying to secure funding or they're trying to win uh, some sort of prize or they're trying to get into an incubator or they want to be on Shark Tank or we've had work with so many people who are uh, have so much at stake with this work that they're giving over to us to design for them uh, that it's really, really meaningful. It's challenging sometimes to be able to work with those real life uh, within those parameters, but it means that you see the benefits of your work instantly. You see the benefits of having those skills and tools you built over the course of those previous uh, 17 weeks, and you're able to apply them very quickly to other clients, and it's really, really valuable to do that. So you do the same thing. These are all the same things that you've seen in previous uh, previous phases where you're just doing them now for a client. You're doing competitive analysis where you look at all the competitors that are out there. You're doing post-it notes and sketching and understanding how to clump that data together to create affinities uh, for those data, uh, data sets. Uh, you're creating a user persona with motivations and frustrations and wants and quotes and things like that. You're creating design principles that actually uh, provide direction to the design you do later on. They take all the research and all the insights you've gained and you create things that you want to base your design, ideas you want to base your design on. These are incredibly valuable for everybody. You create a mental model and understand in many different ways, excuse me, how somebody is going to use this product in, in, uh, in, and uh, there are good things and there are bad things and there are lots of other pieces of information you have to figure out. You create user scenarios and where, how people work with your particular product and how uh, those products work together. You create high fidelity wireframes again for clients. These are all for clients that we've worked with in the past. Um, these are all things that they've asked our teams to do and need to be done for their products, their digital products, websites or apps. Or we've worked with a Smart Mirror before. We've worked with smart watches. We've worked with kiosks. Um, there are lots and lots of company types out there. Uh, we'll create prototypes for them. We'll user test for them. Wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, lots and lots of things even on the UI side we'll do a competitor analysis create style tiles again figuring out the basic building blocks of that design that you want to do they'll look at options for logos we'll create UI kits of all the visual elements that go on that uh, on that tool they'll create key screens um, where they really figure out the big design decisions the big screens that are most important here uh, and they'll create a style guide, and this is called redlining, where you go through everything and you determine exactly the specifics of, okay, this is X number of pixels from this other thing, so that when you hand these files off to the developer, they know exactly how to put the space in between or uh, aligning various things or doing whatever needs to be done. It's really, really important to get to that detail level because that is what they need, especially if these are real clients and these are products that are gonna be designed and developed. Uh, it's really valuable for them to have that much information. Um, because the client phase is now the, it's contracted, we've gone from the virtual phase of six weeks, the immersion phase is five weeks, the client phase is four weeks, that's a compressed time frame. but you're doing the same number of deliverables, if not more sometimes. So you have to be able to work faster and be able to iterate on that faster. If you've done it now two times, you're, in theory, you are more comfortable doing that. We count on people to be more comfortable and more confident to do that, but it does mean that that compressed time frame can cause some stress. There are some pressures of working for real people. Uh, and real people, again, these are real products. They're, there's money behind them. There's competitive advantage. There's lots of really important, meaningful things that come from working with a, uh, a live client, but that can involve a lot of pressure that you have to be aware of and be able to work around. And clients add a layer of complexity to the work. We've had clients like go to China for two weeks of the, of the four week project. We've had them disappear. We've had them change the direction of their you know, of their entire business plan multiple times during that project. And those are things that happen in real life. Clients are weird people sometimes and they cause difficulties. And the more experience you get in doing that, that's, it's tough, but it's actually really, really great because then you have a story, you have the ability to go in to your first design job and say, yeah, I knew how to work with a client who was really bad at communicating, or a client who made us understand that what the problem they were trying to solve was not the one that we spent three weeks solving. 
And there are lots of great things you learn from doing that. Some great benefits of the client phase, you apply your skills to products that need them. Did anybody, how many bad examples of design did you encounter today? A lot, probably. If not, you have a couple hours left in your day, I suggest you just go to Reddit or go to Craigslist. There are those bad examples of design are everywhere. Um, and you're able to do create those that change that's really needed in a product that people are going to use, that people already do use. And that's incredibly meaningful, it's deeply meaningful for people who are doing that work. You get those, uh, instead of sprint reviews, you do weekly presentations, so you actually are meeting with the client every week at the end of every week, and you're presenting that week's work to them, and you're making sure that you're still on track, you're still doing the work that needs to be done, and you're still communicating really effectively with that client. And that's so valuable to be able to go through that weekly and see the work build upon itself, see the confidence that you get in presenting to that client week after week. Um, finally, there's a really good likelihood of your work being developed and, and uh, published in the future uh, by the client. So the thing you design is going to be the thing that actually gets built. And that's awfully exciting. That's a thing that not a lot of other programs like ours can actually do. Uh, they don't really work with live clients. Um, and so they don't really have the ability to, um, to say that you have, you have been able to build something that exists out in the world. Um, so working on a project for Apple uh, is really awesome because Apple has really great design, but it's not really meaningful because it's not, you're not designing for actual Apple users. It's better to go with a really small product, a really small startup that's trying to do something really valuable and meaningful and figure out how to work on their behalf and do something really amazing on their behalf. So at the end of the client phase, we believe that people who go through this phase feel experienced and like comfortable, really, really, uh, they feel like they've had great experiences in applying their skills outward. So the previous phases of this are really about, you know, they're very inward, it's about understanding for yourself these things, but when you do them for yourself, that's very meaningful. When you do them for other people, that's awesome. It's a great, great feeling to be able to do that. So we love providing the client phase as an opportunity for everybody who comes through designation. You actually work on a live client, and it's really, really meaningful to be able to do that. So after this, you feel confident to be able to attack the next phase, and that's a great place to be, and especially towards the end of the program. Uh, Dan, is there anything that you want to add about the client phase? Uh, I don't really have any prepared remarks on this, but I do want to put like a, a bold underline under uh, the kind of upping the level of complexity in this phase. So our hope is that we've prepared you for this at the, uh, to this point. You know, through the scaffolding and DE and virtual and even into immersion, each time through, it's another loop through a process that you, you become more familiar with and gain more intimate knowledge about and hopefully some ownership over. And you get to the client projects and we are, you know, probably in the next, in the next month or two, I think we're going to hit the 300 project mark where we will have done 300 different projects since uh, we first started in 2014. Uh, and this is probably not all of them. Uh, 300 some projects with 150 to 200 different clients. And each one of those projects, while there are broad similarities between them, each one of them brings their own unique challenges, their unique needs. And a lot of the work of design is engaging with that and understanding that and finding a way to solve the problems in a really fast uh, time frame. And so the hope is to this point, we're ready to kind of unleash you on this real world complexity and you're prepared to go, okay, I know this, this is a little different from what I did before, but I know how to tackle this. I know how to handle this. And really at the end of the day, and when Mike talks about the career, career phase, that really is about being able to tell a story about that challenge, being able to speak to this real world complexity that you were able to deal with uh, with a design mindset as a design professional. Absolutely. Any questions anybody has? Anyone uh, Yes. I just, um, as, so I work in a design agency and all of our work is client work. Um, and I just want to point out that client phase was by far one of the most useful pieces of the designation toolkit because we literally present to clients in design sprints every week almost to a T in the exact way that we learned how to do it in client phase. And day one coming into my job, 
at Aitman Studios, I felt super prepared for how to present and speak to my work because of my face and also immersion and learning how to present to work from those two faces. So I just want Awesome. Any, any, any questions for anybody on this space? This is a free service that we offer, by the way, uh, to uh, to companies. Uh, we just want to be able to to provide our designers with the best possible experience, the most professional possible experience. Uh, and as uh, Dan mentioned, you know, these are some of the clients we work with in the past uh, or currently, and there are a lot of vowels missing because these are a lot. Of, these are startups and startups have weird <laughs> names. Um, but, and a lot of these you all have never heard of. Um, there are like four different wine companies in here, which is really interesting, but there's also a smart vest uh, for people with autism to, uh, to, to feel good. There's, uh, you know, people that are monetizing taking selfies. There are people who, uh, gosh, what else? Yeah, delivering food and, and taking care of delivery drivers. All kinds of cool things that come from uh, to getting a deep dive into these various industries that these clients work in. Uh, it's just really, really cool to be able to do that and be able to say, this is a reality-based project. We work with real uh, people and for real purposes. Uh, and that's something that a lot of other programs like ours can't say. The types of clients we're working uh, with are early stage MVPs, in terms of validation and definition, live products that need usability testing and refinement, and then existing products that want to evolve or expand the functionality. Maybe they want to build a B2B version or a B2C version or do their mobile site instead of their desktop site or something like that. Uh, in case anybody in here wants to become a client or is curious about that, designation.io slash RFP is the form that you fill out to become a client. Finally, final phase in our program is the career phase. And that's the last three weeks of, <coughs> of that program. So it's really about communicating effectively to understand the goals you set for yourself and why you came to designation. Why did you want to do get a new career and change your old career to become a designer? Or why did you want to become a digital designer? You have to have answers to those questions because you're the person who asked them. You're the person who wanted to understand what that meant. So everybody has individual goals and directions for themselves and where they might want to take their careers. You have to be able to communicate effectively to meet that goal for yourself. And that puts a lot of the onus back on you. The career phase is almost zero about teamwork. It's about individual work. It's about moving collectively together through a few important things. So there are lots of uh, uh, new and uh, occasionally difficult things that are covered in this phase, You'd like uh, creating a portfolio site, writing case studies, learning how to use LinkedIn uh, and networking with that, writing cover letters, uh, things like that are really, really valuable, but they're not design. They're about communication. They're about putting yourself out there and telling that story. So people will create uh, research for case studies and they'll summarize a lot of really big data and something that's gonna be really meaningful like this. They're gonna take a picture of themselves pointing at a wall of post-its because that looks really smart. And it's really valuable to have this information to say, I work with data. I understood how all this data can work together and flow together and be very valuable. I had learned insights from uh, doing things like card sorting, which is, uh, how you know a, a way of organizing information uh, to to give you uh, some insight that you couldn't get on your own. It's looking at the evolution of something from the very basic paper prototype all the way to the high fidelity, best possible design, uh, high fidelity version of that uh, of that same screen, and stage by stage how it improved. It's presenting key screens in really interesting ways. Uh, it's creating a portfolio site that involves you pointing at a wall of post-its because that looks really smart. Uh, it's looking at ways that you tell your story, especially if you were did like this designer in our program had very, very wildly different experiences as a professional. Here's how she told that story step by step and really made sure that she uh, she made it something that was going to be a big part of the story of who she is today as a designer and all these other things that came before designation. And it's creating really interesting uh, other personal statements and uh, defining for yourself what it means to be a creative professional, what it means to be a designer or somebody who does something very unique. It's creating resumes. Uh, this is Mary's resume actually right now. Uh, and uh, being able to express all the information about yourself and your background in a visually meaningful way. Uh, everybody in this room has written a resume, I'm sure, but designing your resume is a much different beast. And it has to tell a particular type of story to be really successful. And that's one of the tools that you learn in this space. 
there's a lot more things that are created. I mean, a lot more things that you create when you work in the career phase. But some of the challenges that we know everybody experiences in the career phase, it is more communication and writing than design. And that's really difficult for people who don't have much experience being a writer. It's the most fastest pace uh, phase of all of them because it's everything has to be done in three weeks instead of the four or five or six from the previous phases. Um, and there's just a lot of new, interesting, different things that have to be done in that time. And the quality of work, again, it's based on your own expectations for your career path. So if you really want to work at Facebook or you want to work at IDEO or you want to work at Apple or someplace like that, you have to be able to create a portfolio that's going to be that level of quality and to understand what that quality means. So everybody has their own expectations for their own career path. You have to be able to meet it and then exceed it to have a chance at, at getting to that career that you want for yourself. We do tons of supplemental activities in the career phase. Those provide awfully important perspectives on the job search. You do studio tours, you hear from alums, hiring managers, all kinds of other people come in and talk about their experiences and working with designers like you, and that's incredibly valuable. Again, those past professional experiences, no matter if you were a lawyer or a dental assistant or a barista, uh, those all play really big roles. You talk about how those experiences have shaped you as a person who communicates, person who works on a team, person who deals with deadlines or customer service or somebody who knows how to fail really effectively. Uh, that's all really, really valuable. And then all the deliverables you create, your portfolio site, your case studies, your resume, all that stuff, you basically use those for the rest of your career. You will improve them. You will take out work and add new work as time goes on. But basically, those are useful for the rest of your career. The ways that you build them, the ways you tell those stories, will be universally understood and used useful for decades to come. And that's super, super valuable, especially at the end of this phase. So at the end of the career phase, we believe that this is where that lifetime of learning has to come from. It means that you've been prepared to continue learning. You've learned in so many different ways and you've built upon the past uh, piece of information and all the past deliverables and everything else to be able to continue building, continue learning and growing. And so at the end of this phase, at the end of designation, you are prepared to keep learning for the rest of your life. We really stand behind this. We really believe this is something that sets you apart from other competitors, from other people who go through similar programs or even those one year, two year, four year programs, um, because it's really about making sure that you have the tools to keep learning for the rest of your career. Any questions about the career phase? Anybody remote? <clears throat> Any questions? Okay. Uh, a lot of people want to know where our graduates get hired. And this is only a partial list, probably uh, one third to a quarter of all the companies that have hired our people. There are some wonderful, amazing names on this list, like Facebook, uh, like Yelp, uh, like Sephora. Uh, there are in-house teams, there are product companies, there are um, startups, there are agencies and consultancies. There are people who are on this list who went out on their own. They form their own companies. MSTQ was, was somebody's uh, personal company and they, they grew it pretty well. Uh, so there's lots of different types of jobs for graduates out there, especially uh, contract and freelance, if that's something you want to do. And it's really great to be able to have all of these types of jobs. Designation prepares uh, every designer for any of these types of jobs, some more than others, and some require a lot more like one-on-one uh, -on -one work uh, or individual work to be able to get to that point. But um, we really encourage people to start thinking about these areas weeks and weeks before graduation so they understand a little bit more about where they might be going after the program. Because it seems really hazy when you're in it. It's really hard to focus on what comes next when you're, when you're deep in that phase. So we want to make sure that people really start to look ahead and be able to prepare for what that might look like. After graduation, uh, there's four weeks of one-on-one -on -one meetings to review career materials with the creative director of the career phase. We have a job board that's only for designation that is very, very active. A lot of jobs can post on that weekly. So people are always able to share uh, jobs they find or be able to refer other people to those jobs. And every designer in the program gets a one-to-one -one career mentor who's an established professional designer who gives them feedback on their career materials and is able to help them out with the job search, give them resources, talk to them about various things that they can take advantage of as a somebody who's looking for a job. We will not guarantee you a job after graduation. We cannot do that. Any program like, like ours who promises you that, they are lying to you. They are not being uh, good stewards of education, of the design profession. 
Um, we can guarantee, though, that you will learn everything in designation that you need to get a job. That means that the responsibility has always been and will always be on you as a person who says, um, I know that I want to become a designer and change my career and shift into this other area of UX or UI. Um, and we're going to teach you what it takes to get to that point and to stay in that point and stay growing and to stay better, and getting better and stronger over and over again for the rest of your career. Um, so we cannot guarantee you a job. And again, anybody who promises you that, they, that is not an effective way to learn because the responsibility can't be on the program. It must be on you. It must be a way that you are able and ready to be able to make that change and understand what that work builds towards. And that's been one of the most effective uh, ways that we have been able to teach people here, been able to help people into that next career is to understand this right here. That's it, 95.9% .9 of our graduates get a job within six months of graduation. Uh, so that is any type of job that is on that list that could be a short-term contract, might be a full-time job, might be around the world, it might be something that's an apprenticeship. There are all kinds of jobs that are out there um, and it really is about what they want, what they need, and what they find. And some of those things may differ from each other. Uh, we have graduates all over the world now. We're very fortunate to have people who come from everywhere and they go everywhere. Um, and uh, the majority of them, as you can see, are in the United States. We have about quite a few in Chicago, a lot in New York, uh, San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Austin, uh, a couple people in Omaha, I think. A bunch of people in Bentonville, Arkansas. That's really fun. They, they work for Walmart's uh, global e-commerce. Uh, we've also joined a program called SIR, which is the Council on Integrity and Results Reporting, uh, which is one of the only programs in the world that tries to standardize hiring uh, metrics and employment metrics for boot camps and programs like ours. So there are, I believe there are only two, maybe only this one, that exist out there where if you abide by SIR, uh, you are able to provide information about hiring metrics that's uh, kind of like you can see those across any program that reports that. Uh, so that's outcomes of hiring, that's outcomes of time it takes to get a job, outcomes of uh, the uh, average salary after graduation, a lot of information like that. So we believe it's very valuable to have this standardization across the industry and we're really proud to be a part of SIR. Uh, you may be wondering about money. It is, uh, this is a good time to talk about this because this is, now we've shown you everything you get at designation. This is how much designation costs. So the $1,000 is the initial deposit that when you get accepted to our Design Essentials program, which it means getting accepted to the entire program, you have to pay a $1,000 deposit. Not bad. After that comes $14,800. That deposit can be a one-time thing. It can be broken up into four deposits that are equal. Uh, you have to pay them every few weeks. Uh, but that's the remaining balance of the program. So the whole thing together is 15800 Now, that definitely is a lot of money. We are not uh, going to sugarcoat that. When you look at other programs that are like designation, you can start to compare what that means, what that investment means. Again, we just went through 100 slides of things that you can know you can experience when you're in this program. Uh, so hopefully it really makes that abstract number, that very large abstract number, feel more tangible, feel more understandable. So you look at the base enrollment for these other programs and they vary pretty wildly. You even look at Center Center over in Chattanooga, that's a $60,000 program. You also look at it and it takes two full years, that's 90 weeks. So even if you look at the cost per week between their program and designation, it's, slight, it's about the same, but it's a little bit different. And all the other programs that are really quick, the 10 week program, eight week program, 12 weeks, um, those are, pretty similarly priced designation. So they end up costing a lot more per week. And that's that can be very difficult to think about. You also have to think about, you know, do you want to work remotely? Some people are really good at that. And some people really need that in-person experience. They need to be able to be around people and learn from other people in person. So you have to look at those options also. So there's a lot to weigh when you think about all the programs that are out there. And this is just a fraction of the boot camps and design programs, immersive programs that are out there. There's a way, way more even when you talk about dev, like front end development. Um, so there's a lot of data that's out there and you have to be able to make sense of it. Uh, one of the ways that we help uh, with people who are, help people with uh, paying for the program is with, we have two financing partners. One is Skills Fund, the other is Climb. Skills Fund actually 
uh, created the SIR program, so we're really pleased to work with them. And then CLIMB, these are both opportunities where you fill out a quick application. These are built for people who are going through programs like ours. They are expressly built for boot camps and immersive programs to be able to finance them, so they know exactly what you're going through. They've worked with hundreds of designation grads in the past, so they're able to work with you really closely and really easily in ways that are going to be you know, much easier than getting a bank loan or doing something else like that, if you need it. Uh, quickly, I want to mention their upcoming cohorts that we have here. Uh, we're, we're currently accepting applications for both the Indigo and Juniper cohort. We name our cohorts after colors. So we have Ember right now is going through the program. We have Fuchsia that's starting in our space here in the uh, immersion phase on uh, Monday. We have Garnet and Hyacinth and then now Indigo and Juniper. We figured out all the way to P, Plum, I think. Anyway, we have a lot of colors and plants and uh, Steven Universe characters to, to share uh, in, in all of our uh, all of our uh, cohorts. But the dates here, so Indigo starts on June 4th, that's the next uh, uh, cohort that uh, begins. And then the virtual phase starts July 23rd, in-person phase runs September until December 7th. That's the last uh, uh, cohort that runs in 2018. The Juniper cohort starts Design Essentials July 23rd, starts the virtual phase September 10th. And then the in-person phase starts in October and runs through January because we have uh, time off there for Thanksgiving and um, the holidays. We also now have a cohort in New York that we are accepting applications for. So um, a big part of our New York office is WeWork. We, have, we will have a location in the New York uh, area at a WeWork somewhere in there and it, the experience will be very, very similar to this one. So it's a big deal to be able to have a second location uh, for people who are in New York on the East Coast or just interested in living in New York, uh, anybody in this room or who's on, who's ever is on the, uh, the virtual uh, hangout can apply to either the New York cohort or the Chicago cohort. And the dates here run the same. So the New York cohort runs the same dates in Chicago as it does in New York, and it also ends on December 7th. So we are accepting applications for New York. Admission to designation is not a guarantee. This is also a problem with other boot camps. They will uh, accept anybody who applies to them. Um, and that is not the case here. We uh, accept about 75% of applicants. That number goes up or down depending on the time of year. Um, but we're, we are proud to be somewhat selective. We're also proud that it, this means that there are people that may not look good on paper, but they show potential. They have a story, they have an interesting background, they express uh, ideas about the design process or design thinking in their daily lives, and there are people who uh, may be really, may make for really interesting designers. So we're happy that there, we are a little bit selective and we're able to provide a better experience because of that. You may be asking yourself, what do we look for in applicants? Uh, we expect a few things uh, to see a few things because we know how important these are for everyday design work. We expect people to have a little bit of experience in learning by doing, in conflict resolution, creative thinking, objectively uh, approaching their work, uh, career planning, and self-reflection. We want some experience, good experience in managing your own time, active listening, uh, acting like a professional, decision-making, self-sufficiency, having a growth mindset, and collaboration. And we really have uh, uh, expectation for strong experience in self-awareness uh, because we know how you know difficult this process is and you have to be self-aware of your strengths and weaknesses. Motivation and engagement and staying motivated and staying engaged after the 70 hour week has ended and still having more work ahead of you. And just plain giving a shit. It's just really, really important to be able to give a shit and, and whether that's for yourself, your team, your users, the client, whatever else, you have to be aware of what, you know, how important that work is. It's really, really valuable. Uh, we mentioned the different types of designers who uh, apply to designation or come through designation. We have career starters or people with minimal job or design experience. You may think uh, that you fall into one of these categories. Uh, we have career switchers and applicants with a professional background that has a professional experience but is not related to design. Uh, and then we have career advancers, and those are people with a background in a type of design or they're related to design. In other words, that looks like this. So career starters are people who are 18 and they know that college isn't for them. They want an experience like ours. They're people who have been service job holders. Uh, they haven't really held down any type of career in their lives to date. We have a bunch of switchers. These are, again, everybody from a teacher to a baker to a pastry chef. We literally had a pastry chef 
come to the program uh, two years ago, one year ago. Uh, and then career advancers are people like graphic designers, motion designers, art directors, uh, and then architects, design strategists, account executives, people who are familiar with design, design process, but they're not necessarily graphic designer, or digital designers. Uh, I just want to go through really quickly the steps to, in the application process. Uh, you fill out an application at designation.io slash apply. Anyone in this room fill out an application yet? Maybe tonight or maybe tomorrow. In fact, we, will, we can stick around a little bit if you'd like to apply in person because that's something that we can offer you right here if you'd like to get more information about it. Um, the application is super quick. It is very, very quick, and that's intentional. We want it to be something that doesn't take that much time. Uh, because the details come later in the process. Uh, everyone who fills out an application gets an interview with the admissions team, that may be Courtney or maybe someone else. Um, that could be in person here at WeWork or through a Google Hangout or Skype. Uh, and then there are three potential outcomes of that uh, interview. If they show strong potential for success, they are accepted in the program, and then they're sent that invoice for that $1,000 deposit for Design Essentials, and they join Design Essentials in the cohort of their choosing. If they show some potential for success, that doesn't necessarily guarantee that they're going to be accepted into the program. So we ha have something called self-paced design essentials, which is actually a slower version of that DE phase, uh, and it's something that gives them a chance to learn at their own pace. So if people are really interested and excited about design, but they have really no experience in it, self-paced DE is an opportunity to learn at their own pace, be able to grow as needed, and even also keep their full-time job or other things in their life uh, that are going to be important to them. They may also be asked to complete a design challenge, which they return in a few days. Design challenge is an exercise that demonstrates critical thinking communication skills. So it's not about solving a problem. It's about talking about how you attempt to solve a problem, talking about just be, being on that road to solving it. Um, and then the applicant's results are evaluated. And at that point, we either accept or deny based on the results of either of those things. So there's lots of that hands-on review process that happens with everyone who comes to the program. Uh, when somebody does, uh, unfortunately, show very little potential for success in designation, which again happens about 25% of the time, most likely, uh, they are denied admission to designation. Uh, and we hope that's not the end of our experiences with them. We hope that's not the end of the road. Uh, we give them a reading list and a list of websites and other resources. And we ask them to learn much more about digital design. So there are people in the program who we did not accept. Six months later, they came back and said, I read these books, I went to these sites, I started doing a daily UI challenge or whatever that is. Um, I want to be able to reapply. We gave them the opportunity to do that. And that's really cool to be able to have seen that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, participation in DE is only available if you apply and are accepted into the entire program. So you have to be able to be admitted to the whole thing to be able to do DE. However, DE is a standalone module. If you want to only do that and then quit, you're welcome to do so. You just have to know you have to be accepted to the entire program from the beginning. Uh, next steps after tonight, we are almost done with the content here and then I'd love to open it up for more questions. Uh, if you want to learn more about the program and apply, please email Courtney at designation.io. Uh, Dan at designation.io is back here. You heard from him a minute ago and that's to, if you're curious about working with designation as a client, or if you know anybody outside this room who might be interested in becoming a client, have them talk to Dan. And then myself, um, my email address is j-l-o-s-s-e at designation.io. Uh, it's working with a graduate in a contract or full-time role. If you have a need for a designer, uh, whether that's a paid or a pro bono or an internship or whatever else, if you'd like to hire a designation graduate, definitely come talk to me. Also, can I miss on social media? You will see lots of information about these uh, plastered all over these uh, these infinites uh, all over these channels, especially in the next few days, uh, as we make the recording available of, uh, of tonight's event. Uh, we, this is a great way to learn about what our culture is like. We give a lot of really great information about uh, the program on Facebook, Twitter. We we source a lot of uh, articles, resources, other things that the design industry is is doing right now, and we love being able to kind of create a tapestry of. Uh, how people can understand what's happening in the industry today. And our Instagram is just is a lot of pictures, and we have an increasing number of dog pictures that we love posting on Instagram. But that's also the daily life, how people work together, how people celebrate, what the food that people are eating, and how people work together. There's a lot of really great things that come from all these channels. We hope you will follow them uh, and get to know us a whole lot more in a whole lot more detail. Also, 
If you want to hear directly from applicants, this is the absolute best way to learn about designation is to read what graduates from the program have written about us. So coursereport.com and switchup.org, those are two sites that compare a lot of programs like designation, immersive design programs, and there are dozens of reviews in both locations from designation graduates. And they will tell you the honest, specific truths about going to designation, going through designation, and what happens after. They are not all, you know, puppies and rainbows. There are definitely things that they talk about that they want us to fix or they want us to address, and we do, we do address them. So you can see reviews going back all the way to like 2014, uh, both those sites, um, but there have been a lot more posts recently. We've talked about the most recent iteration of the program, and we'd love for you to talk, uh, to, to listen to those. Uh, so our blog, designation.io slash blog, uh, has a lot of alumni interviews, dozens of alumni interviews from alums that have gone out into the world and they're working somewhere today, and they talk about their experiences in the program, after the program, getting their first job, and then getting settled in their first job. And that's awesome to be able to hear from them directly, unedited, and you also see some of the work they did uh, in their uh, time at designation. So I want to leave you with uh, a thought that uh, has become very meaningful for us as we talk about the designation experience to people who apply to the program, people who are in the program. Designation is not the step you take in order to start to, to before you start your design career. Designation is the start of your design career. And you probably heard me never mention the word students. That's because we don't consider people who come through designation students. We believe that people who call themselves students think of themselves as being subservient to a teacher, or they think of themselves as not needing to take responsibility for their own actions, that that's the teacher's responsibility. And that is very far from the truth. We are as professional and, and experienced a program as you will find in the world. We're very proud of that. And that means that we built the curriculum and can continue to refine it to make sure that this is the beginning of your design career. And the things you experience at designation will be present for you in your first job, your second job, your third job, all the way down for the rest of your career. And there's a lot of really important things that come from being a professional, being a designer, thinking like a designer, and working like one. And that's really the, the basis for our entire curriculum and our experience. So in other words, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> this little Muppet right here is Bernadette, and she is about yay big. And uh, we love having her, just like we love having you guys here. So uh, any questions, anything that uh, we can talk about? I'm ask the virtual phase, like how, on what basis you create a team, and uh, like how many people are there in one team, and how <coughs> selection of projects is there? Sure. So the question was, and I apologize, I'm going to reiterate for the virtual folks. Um, in the virtual phase, uh, how are teams selected? How many people per team? And then the third part of that question was? Uh, what projects? What projects? Okay. Uh, so um, every every phase that has teamwork involved, that's uh, Design Essentials, Virtual Immersion, and Client, um, we always collect feedback from the previous phase. And the career director, the designers, the residents, the TAs, other people there, and we decide as much as possible who is going to be a good uh, you know, teammate with someone else. So if there's a person who is really uh, uh, extrovert and they're excited to present, and they're really, they're the first one to speak and they're really eager and they're really you know, excited, we want to pair them with somebody who maybe is more of an introvert because they can teach each other things. They can teach the introvert um, how to be a little bit more outspoken. The introvert can maybe talk to the extrovert about ways they can process some of their thoughts internally instead of externally. Um, and that same kind of evaluation process happens at the end of every phase. So when the next phase starts, we reevaluate re where everybody's at, how much they've grown, what their skills are, um, how strong they are in various areas, and say, all right, let's shuffle the teams again. So we try to make sure that you are never on the same team, depending on the cohort size. Uh, we try not to have you repeat the same team twice in a row. It sometimes happens, um, but we, uh, we definitely can't, can't guarantee you will not be on the same team as, as the same person multiple times. It's just that's impossible to Teams are uh, anywhere from, in the virtual phase, there are probably three to four people a piece. Uh, in the client phase, we occasionally have teams of two, and very, very rarely have teams of five, but that's an awful lot of people. We try to keep it to three to four people. 
And the types of projects that are worked on in the virtual phase, there's a set uh, prompt that's sort of a mock project that we give out in the virtual phase. And uh, I believe for UX, it's happened. Yeah, it's a library. Library. UX is the, so there's a library problem. So you work on libraries, you go into the library and interview people and create a tool that will help patrons of libraries. And then the UI project is AdFit. So it's a, uh, it's like creating a, a marketing site and a mobile app for a uh, uh, personal health care where. Yeah, that's the current, that's the current uh, uh, one. I think we're going to change it. Did that answer your earlier questions? Great. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Do you find that people know whether they want to do uh, UX or UI from the beginning, or is it something that they really discover in that first six weeks? Yeah. So the question is whether uh, we see people knowing before they come into designation if they want to do UX or UI, or do they choose over time? The answer is both. Um, the answer is it depends. Uh, we see a lot of people who are pretty clear about that. Usually they are already in design or they're very closely related to design, so they already understand what UX is and what UI is, and they're more likely to be able to pick one at that point. Uh, but otherwise, that's what Design Essentials is for. That's the sampler platter. So you get exposure to UX and research and design and then UI. Um, so then you're able to make a choice. And you spend a week, a week and a half on each of those areas. So you can, at the end of it, say, well, I believe I'm more confident at this area. And you'll get feedback from your career director and the TAs that say, um, yeah, we think you're also strong in these areas, so we really strongly consider you do UX or UI. So it definitely varies from person to person. Is something that you select, or is it something that I would also have in the mind that I want to focus on? You know, everybody makes that determination for themselves. Okay. Um, if we absolutely see that, you know, you, somebody is very strong in one area and very weak in the other, we will strongly encourage them to go in the area that they're strongest in. However, sometimes, um, you know, people want to be able to choose the area that they're weaker in as a bigger challenge for themselves. So we want to be able to make sure that people stand behind the decision they make as far as which track they want to go on. We also, by the way, at the, at the end of, after graduation, uh, when you've been out of the program for a few weeks and you have your portfolio site up and your case studies up, we'll uh, grant you access to the other curriculum. So if you've done UX through the entire program, after graduation, you want to learn UI, we'll give you access to that curriculum. On Canvas, same thing if you did UI in the program, you want to learn UX. So you go through that, you know, the entire front to back on that particular track, you finish your portfolio, then we want you to keep learning. So there's an opportunity to become more of that sort of full stack designer. And that's the on-site part that requires you to be full-time here? Or the on-site part requires more than full-time, 70 to 80 hours a week. So you will not, nobody is able to balance that with a job. We've seen people try to balance that even with like part-time bartending jobs, and it's really, really tough. Or Uber driving jobs, and it's really tough to be able to do that. What if I apply and then the time phase comes, I'm already on the or I'm already working? I'm sorry. There's, there's some flexibility to it, like see, as the course goes from June to December, uh -huh. and then the once I part comes and for some reason I'm not able to do full time, uh -huh. how then that works? So anybody is able to, I mean, it's, it's strongly discouraged to leave the program in the middle of it because the way the curriculum continues and builds upon itself, that it gets stronger and stronger and you get stronger and stronger as you go through it. But there are people who have quit the program in the middle of it who said, um, I had an offer from a startup or I wanted to start my own company or something like that. And they were able to do that. It's just, you're not really welcome back after that because you are missing out on the rest of the, the curriculum, the rest of the experience there. We had a question from uh, somebody who wrote. Yeah, um, someone asked, what's the most challenging phase and why? Ooh, <laughs> what's the most challenging phase and why? The answer is all of them for, for different reasons. The design essentials phase is the toughest because it's the beginning. If you have no uh, experience in design, all this stuff is very foreign and difficult for you, and so it's hard to just get started. The virtual phase is the most challenging because it requires being virtual and everybody is virtual and spread out. It's really hard to work together as a team and I find that really challenging. The immersion phase is the most challenging because 
it is the most intensive, it's immersive. So you come here and you just work your ass off for however many, you know, for five weeks uh, on a project that is very, very intense. Uh, the uh, client phase is the most challenging because you have the pressure of working for a live client and you have to be able to work on uh, their needs and not your needs for them. And the career phase is the most challenging because it's communication, not design. So if you've never written before, or put together a resume or done an interview or something like that, then it's going to be really, really difficult because your design skills are not going to be the primary means by which you find success. So Great. all of it. <laughs> well, that's a great transition to our next question great. about the career phase specifically. Okay. Uh, someone asked, how long will it typically take for me to finish my portfolio? Uh, the question is, how long will it typically take to finish a portfolio? It depends on the person's ability to work fast in the program. Very few people finish their portfolio while they're at designation. That's because the amount of work that's required, the amount of process work as uh, writing, refining, reviewing, editing, critiquing all these materials just takes longer than the three weeks that are available. Uh, so it, uh, it, we try to give everybody the tools that they can take that information, that review process, and apply it to, to their own work after the program ends. So they can go kind of keep going on that as, as long as possible. We found the people who finish their portfolio within two or three weeks are the ones that get, have a stronger chance of finding a job. The people who go on a cruise after a designation graduates, or they go catch up on Orange is the New Black for like you know, four weeks at a time and sleep in for a month. Those are people who have a very hard time getting back into the swing of things. It's really about, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, rigor, like determination. Like you get those at designation, you practice those on a daily basis. You have to work hard and work fast and be able to move on to the next thing and time box yourself and have a really good attitude about it. And if you miss any of those things after graduation, when you're out on your own, in your own city, or you're trying to find your own job or whatever that is, it gets a lot harder to do that. It gets very easy to just say, well, I'll give up, I'll slow down, I'll do whatever. And when you lose that momentum, it can be really, really challenging to get it back. So we really encourage people to continue working at the same pace, that same 70, 80 hours a week pace, even after graduation, to be able to finish it on time, whenever possible. Anybody else? Yes. For anyone who already has like a like a design background, say graphic design or something like that. Yeah. Do they also require to do the central phase, or do they have a chance to just um, maybe uh, skip that phase? They already have a design background. Yeah. So that the question is, um, if somebody already has a graphic design background, for example, or a product design or digital design background, can they skip design essentials? The answer is not anymore. Uh, we used to be able to, to do that, and you may read reviews and some other things online about people talking about being able to do that, and that was in the past. Uh, mainly, we found that people, even with significant design skills, needed the design essentials experience to be a team building experience, to understand how you know this program worked, to get the sense of how you know each thing built to the next thing, all the, the other experiences and intangible parts of it. Um, and it made the, like if, so that meant if the work was easier for them, they could shift their focus to helping others or being able to do the extra credit assignments or any other deliverables that were really important, or they just were able to develop that knowledge even further and come into the virtual phase, the immersion phase, really, really strong. So we no longer allow people to skip design essentials. Uh <clears throat> We have another question. Uh, any suggestions or advice to prepare for the design essentials phase? I'll be in the Indigo cohort. Oh, Indigo. How to prepare for design essentials? Uh, so we have a reading list uh, that we uh, we make available. Um, gosh, I don't know if we have that in this. I could append that to this deck maybe and send it out. We can figure out ways to get that to people. But there are books like uh, Don't Make Me Think. Um, What's another one about face? Do we still? About face is like about the same text. Yeah, about face is a big one. I mean, these are things that you'll read uh, in that phase, but getting the hang of them in advance is really important. Um, you know, just keeping up with the industry. What uh, what articles are being posted on Medium about UX and UI? Uh, what really great work is out there? Just the cool shit that people produce and the people that people talk about on Dribble and Behance uh, and other you know portfolio sites, site of the day. 
those types of things. You just immerse yourself in that world. It's going to be really, really valuable to be able to do that. So just understanding, we don't expect people to know the language of UX or UI or be able to produce something that's designed. We expect that people are hungry to learn. They're ready to learn that. And the ability to do that is to just go out on your own and discover those things before the official program begins. Anybody else? Yeah. I would just say the 70 to 80 hours is distributed like evenly throughout the week or or during the five days of the week or also? Uh, the question was uh, in the in-person phases, the 70 to 80 hour a week uh, phases, how is that time distributed? Um, I would probably say pretty evenly. Um, you know, maybe less on Saturdays and significantly less on Sundays, but yeah, between Monday and Friday, you know, there's all kinds of check-ins and reviews and presentations and we do the morning huddle every morning at 10 a.m. and there's teamwork and communication and there's a break for lunch and a break to pet the dog and it's in the office and uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on so it's hard to kind of predict which days of the week are going to be longer or harder than others but there you kind of develop a rhythm especially if you know that your presentations are going to be on Thursdays or Fridays or Mondays your check-ins are going to be at a certain time there are certain things that are going to kind of come from with the schedule like that um, but for the most part, it just sort of varies from week to week. I would say. Current designers, any, any uh, other things to add on that? I think mean, it's also dependent on like your work style. I think it's also dependent on your own personal work style um, so, and working with your team because you're not working alone, it's teamwork. So you need to make sure you collaborate with them and make sure you have your own schedule where you can work on together and communication and stuff. My mentioned earlier is really important. Um, so you kind of create your schedule based off of whatever the project is, what your teammates decided on working together, um, as well as workshops that will probably schedule too. So there's a lot of time management and knowing yourself and what is required. So there might be some times where you finish earlier and you get to go back and reiterate and focus on improving uh, that design that you made, uh, or other times where you're really going to be on the clock. Where Hard to, hard to get uh, to the next level. Any other questions? Anyone from the computer? <laughs> Not recently. Uh, um, before we wrap up, are there anybody else who's present? Any current designers? Emily? Uh, Mary, Dan, Doug, anybody have anything else you want to add? Oh, yes, please. Uh, I have a question. I, we usually have a lot of students who have never had experience in design. Uh, uh, most of the time, like, the students that are coming here like, don't what they want and have experience before. Yeah. So the question was uh, whether we get a lot of designers in the program who have uh, zero or near zero experience with design. Um, the, the reason why we I kind of focused on the career starters, the career switchers, and career advancers is because we see that breakdown very frequently. So about a third of the people have no hard skills or soft skills around design. And a third of the people have maybe soft skills or they're transferable skills. They've worked with people or deadlines or budgets or uh, they work iteratively or they do interviews or whatever that is that are related to design. And then maybe a third of the people have a uh, either small or high level of some sort of design experience. And that varies wildly from cohort to cohort. We've had some that where nobody had design experience. We've had others where I think this cohort actually has a lot of significant design experience, graphic design, photography, um, architecture, things like that. Um, and that's really cool to see. And some of those people who have uh, significant design experience will go into user interface design and the UI track so they can get stronger on the visual design side. Some of those graphic designers will go into UX because they think that they want to be more well-rounded and that's a good way to kind of build out those other skills they don't already have. So there's a lot of variety in that um, and it just, it really like I said, the country is pretty wild. So I think that that um, combination of those backgrounds is, is like deeply meaningful for the experience you end up having. If there's somebody who has, who's been a stay-at-home mom for several years working with somebody who's been a lawyer, uh, on a team together, they're going to teach each other a lot about their own experiences and how to approach a problem from different perspectives. And they're going to have different strengths. They're going to each lead the team at different times. 
and other times they will support someone else leading that team. So we, we really like that different sort of breakdown of every cohort um, because it adds a lot of, I think, exceptional experience to, the, to that experience for the people going through it. Is that it? Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, take some carrots or broccoli. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. But I believe the question was, how often do we have uh, people who have, who have not experienced it? Yeah, about a third of the time. Yeah. Again, in terms of like zero design experience, probably over half of that. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely um, quite a few people who have always been curious about design, but never really engaged in it. Um, yeah, I think one of my favorite stories is somebody who uh, she lived in Ukraine and taught herself Photoshop at age 15. And then her parents said, you can't do this. You have to do something that makes money. So she went and became a dental assistant and then moved to the United States a long time later, went through a program, and she's now making six figures at Walmart Global E-Commerce, doing the thing that she originally kind of had, like a, the, the voice in her head told her, you know, you can't do that. So we get that up, but a lot of people, as they're interested, they're curious, they've never done it for whatever reason. And so they don't have that experience in their background, but they're ready, they're eager. And especially if you are coming to this program in your late 20s, in your early 30s, even sometimes a lot later, um, you have that drive to be able to say, this is my chance to be able to do this now. And I don't need to spend two years or four years or a hundred grand on this. I can do it quicker and, and easier. Did you have one more thing for me? Okay. Uh, well, thank you everybody for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Grab some broccoli for the road uh, or cookies, <laughs> anti-broccoli, uh, grab a drink. Uh, feel free to say hello to any of us afterward. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll see you later.